Now, this is something I was originally just going to skip over. After playing Pokemon Stadium 1 and 2 for my first Pokemon visit years ago, I thought this was just going to be the GameCube's take on it. Only, you know, they got to make it more grandiose, so instead of a stadium, it's now a coliseum. But then, folks started telling me that Coliseum was in fact an RPG in its own way. It has a story mode and a sequel to boot, Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness, which I'll cover next time. So okay, looks like we have ourselves a hefty spin-off duology to cover here. But I should cover Coliseum's battle mode first since I had a feeling I wouldn't be spending much time on it. There wasn't anything much to the stadium games. You could migrate your favorite Pokemon from the Game Boy games using this transfer pack and then duke it out in fully 3D battles. Or you could at least uh, rent Pokemon in case you didn't have a Game Boy to at least get something out of it. All of this still holds true for Coliseum, only instead of a transfer pack, you can link your Game Boy Advance to the GameCube and transfer your team from Pokemon Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald, or you can use your team that you built in story mode. You need at least one Game Boy Advance along with separate copies of Pokemon Gen 3 for each Game Boy Advance to even consider playing multiplayer, so we won't be talking about that for this video, although I'd imagine there's not much to get. Pokemon battles with friends, nothing to it. I don't know why they didn't allow you to just use multiple GameCube controllers, at least for rental battles. I was never a fan of how certain GameCube games handled multiplayer in this fashion. I know we now live in a day where controllers cost as much as a game, if not a little more, but needing a whole handheld with a copy of a game to go with it in 2004? Yeah, a little ridiculous. There are still single player matches, however, pitting you against an assortment of AI opponents where you can use your dedicated team or what's available from this limited randomized selection. It's also the only time you could participate in traditional one-on-one -on -one battles because in the game's story mode, it's all double battles. But all right, let's talk about this story mode, the real meat and potatoes. If the meat was very lean and the potatoes were tater tots. I gotta give it to them though, the game's intro knows how to hook you. Our story begins in the Ore region, I think it's pronounced Ore, or maybe it's just Ore, a land where wild Pokemon are nowhere to be found, and is home to some rather unpleasant gangs and assholes. I'm gonna assume these folks had their Pokemon imported from different regions, if there's no wild Pokemon, well then how the hell do they have them at all? Is there an Amazon Pokemon service? Well, we see this dude in this spiffy blue coat ransacking this building belonging to Team Snagum a gang dedicated to stealing other trainers Pokemon for their own benefit using this Snaga machine. This dude, canonically known as Wes, was formerly a member of the team, but I guess he didn't like the lack of a union and decided to defect. He destroys the Snaga machine, takes the portable version of it for himself, and then with a smile on his face, blows the hideout to kingdom come making a getaway with his motorbike straight out of a Mad Max flick. Now that is a way to captivate me. Already I wanted to know more about this kid. What's he like? What are his beliefs? What motivated him to join the bad guys? What motivated him to leave? In the first two minutes, Wes was already impressing me more than how previous protagonists did. And then the game just pushes that all to the side to have a standard Team Rocket plot. Not long after blowing up the hideout, Wes saves this girl named Rui from these bunch of goons who were trying to kidnap her. An evil organization known as Cypher, which I can't say out loud without thinking of Metal Gear Solid V. <gasps> Cypher is bent on world domination using an army of shadow Pokemon, Pokemon they've corrupted through scientific experiments that makes them more savage and dangerous. Rui, for some reason, can identify a shadow Pokemon by noticing their dark aura. And I don't know if it's just a bad angle or an effect, but her eyes look super far apart when she's using her power too. Woo! But anyway, she implores Wes to help capture these rabid beasts using his portable Snaga machine and find a way to restore them back to normal. And that is about the gist of this story. From this point, you travel from location to location, beat up some gangsters in Pokemon battles, and take on Cypher's team of misfits. This disco dude, this big oaf, this forgettable lady, this forgettable scientist, and one of the most obviously evil designs for a villain I've seen in Pokemon yet. Nothing much comes from these guys besides the usual antagonistic qualities. They're jerks, they want to use shadow Pokemon for nefarious means, and when you whip their ass, they hightail it out of there. Colosseum story mode is what happens when you take the Team Rocket subplot and make that the entire focus, and on paper, that is absolutely fine. Colosseum breaks away from the series formula in several ways. You don't travel in routes to get from one location to another, you simply pick the next area on the map, and then you immediately travel there on your motorbike. This also means no HMs, no trees to cut, no rocks to push, no waterfalls to climb. There are no wild Pokemon encounters, it's just trainer battles, there's no Pokemon League, no Elite Four. These are just not a thing in the story, and that's fine. As far as the story goes, I'd rather they just focus on one element and flesh it out to make it more engaging, but this game falls flat on that anyway. Cypher is no more interesting than anyone we encounter in Team Rocket or Team Aqua and Magma, given how no time is spent fleshing any of these villains out. Nobody's fleshed out here, and in Wes's case, that's so disappointing, because that intro showed me a lot of promise. I'm thinking this is going to be a refreshing change of pace. He's smiling after blowing up a building filled with former companions. He's got this badass bike. Just take a look at him. In any other game, he would be the antagonist, a rival at the very least, and this was our main character. 
But after the intro, nothing, zilch, nada, zero. He's the standard silent protagonist with no say in anything, no interaction with anything or anyone, not even Rui, who after rescuing her, sticks by your side for the rest of the adventure. But even she doesn't amount to anything special, she is just an accessory to service the gameplay. She can point out shadow Pokemon for you to catch, and that's it. Any sort of communication or dialogue she has never extends much beyond the usual, come on, we should help the shadow Pokemon, or we should stop Team Cypher. I'll tell you what she is good at, though, physically getting in the way. I'm trying to navigate through some corridors and she's repeatedly standing in front of me and slowing me down. Not enough to be frustrating, but it was getting annoying. It's all a shame too, because a darker story has tons of potential in the world of Pokemon, and honestly, I thought the region itself was rather interesting. A little small, yeah, but I like the idea of an area that's not all jovial. The world's not all sunshine and rainbows, and this region is a good example of that. There's a couple of towns that are the standard flavor, full of bright colors complete with Poke Shops and Pokemon Centers to heal your team, but there's also places like Pyrite Town or The Under, where you got your cynics, your assholes, and those that don't really give a shit. It also costs actual money to heal your team here, which I know is nothing new for traditional RPGs, but in Pokemon, what, it's not always free? Oh shit. But again, doesn't mean that much because the execution is half-hearted, but the idea is great. I admire the attempt. And maybe this is something that Gale of Darkness will fix. It feels like the story mode of this game was an obligatory inclusion. Something to get more bang for your buck in terms of sheer playtime, but the lack of substance kills it. It's 10% story and 90% Pokemon battles and ugh. It's nothing but double battles in Colosseum and in Pokemon before generation five and beyond, these can be very slow. There's nothing snappy about them. Battle animations can be drawn out and take a little time to resolve. For what it's worth, battles look good and the special effects for techniques have a lot of crunch to their design. The Pokemon look good in action too. Some of them, particularly the generation one Pokemon, don't look much better than their stadium models though. I wouldn't be surprised if it was just their stadium models with just a tad more polish. I mean, just look at Machamp here. Poor dude did not transition to the GameCube well at all. The game's got some pretty catchy themes too. I can't say much for the town themes or other areas, but I was bopping my head whenever it was time to fight. I particularly enjoyed the themes when we went against Cypher Goons. Reminds me a lot of Mega Man X music from the PS1 era. And the administrator battle themes is kind of a weird mix of being silly and serious, which fits perfectly when you're fighting a man with a Pokeball as an afro. A game with nothing but double battles does call for a more strategic approach, like in Gen 3, because you have to consider what moves will affect the playing field in its entirety. There's also more incentive in using status conditions for buffing purposes or disruptions, and since this is the Generation 3 spinoff, we have the inclusion of natures and Pokemon abilities to also consider when cooking up strategies. Colosseum is one of the hardest games in the franchise. No wild Pokemon means you can only rely on trainer battles to gain experience, but the linear progression along with the lack of routes between towns means you're likely just fighting the new trainers as you're proceeding through the story. As such, trainers are always at either your exact levels or slightly beyond what you currently have. Though in certain areas, it is possible to have rematches with trainers. It's never really explained, but it's kind of like the whole area resets. But the trainers will have stronger Pokemon, so they do scale with your progression to make experience gains worth the backtracking. Still, the Cypher administrators were usually about five to seven levels above what I had regardless, and it caught me off guard repeatedly. With basic type matching, nothing is overly punishing, but you will be investing in healing items more than you've ever done before. Good God. When I got to the Shadow Pokemon lab, I had to leave and re-enter the area three times because of a large number of trainers that were impeding my progress, who would often ambush me out of nowhere and drain my resources fast because the level gap was still so small. But you know, there's nothing else to this dungeon otherwise. You get to this point where one of the lab scientists activates the alarm saying you can't leave the area now, but you can still just walk out of the place. And this is a small thing, but you got these set of stairs here with an elevator that you can use once you clear the area of its trainers. Elevators are normally used as a shortcut to get to the exit faster. It's only two seconds faster than using the stairs. As weird as it sounds, I think this perfectly sums up the amount of thought that went into the dungeon design of Colosseum. I feel this is an RPG that only cares about the battle system and not so much the world around you. On a more positive note, I felt Colosseum did help me see the benefits of moves I would never consider using earlier. Helping hand to make my partner's next attack more punishing, manipulating the weather to weaken my opponent's accuracy or force them to use specific moves to my advantage. I found great use in debuffs this go around, the confused status especially. What do you do when you can't defeat your opponent in one or two shots? You gotta find other means, and Colosseum helped me in thinking of new strategies, which was fulfilling to a degree. But before I elaborate on that point, I'd say another reason for the higher difficulty is the extremely limited selection of Pokemon available. You start with an Umbreon and Espeon, and they're plenty capable, but you will need to add more to your team as you press on. 
And unlike earlier games, you start with Pokemon in their high 20s to early 30s, so you have more in your arsenal of moves from the start, but so does your opponent. In a way, the game kind of assumes you've played Pokemon before because it doesn't waste time with tutorials and all that sort of thing, you're just kind of thrown in there. Which, I don't know, might be a good or bad thing for you. With no wild Pokemon, you need to use your portable Snagum device to take shadow Pokemon from other trainers and then add them to your ranks. Despite the different circumstances, it's no different than catching Pokemon in other games. You weaken the Pokemon enough, throw a ball at it, and then hope for the best. The opposing trainer will also not give a flying shit that you're attempting this for the record. I know the majority of your fights are against evil dickheads or at least implied to be douchebags, so there's no real moral conundrum here, but you think the trainer would at least get on your ass for attempting to steal their Pokemon. Evil or not, if I saw someone trying to take my Pokemon, I'd stop the battle immediately and beat the shit out of that trainer. But that's not the case here, there's no repercussions. However, not every Pokemon is a shadow Pokemon, and when Rui does spot one, it could be someone you're not familiar with at all. If you're the type that loves playing Pokemon with a specific set, be they good for competitiveness or just your personal favorites, you're gonna need to drop that hard because it's likely you'll be recruiting a Pokemon you've never used before. But you have no choice given the limited selection if you want a wider move pool. Until this game, I never used Mantine from Generation 2. I just never found them visually compelling, but I wanted a water type, I had a feeling I wouldn't be getting a Vaporeon or Gyarados in this game, and I was right on that assumption. And I figured that as long as I could practice basic type matching, then that's all that really matters. And yeah, as always, that's the key to winning battles, only this time you're likely using a completely different team than what you're used to. Instead of a Kadabra or Alakazam for psychic types, I had an Espeon. I normally don't even have dark types in my team, but Umbreon proved very effective in tanking hits and dealing with ghost types. I didn't have my Raichu, but Ampharos was more than enough to fill the void. I took what I can get while still trying to respect my preferences, but I struggled with getting a decent fire type, and as such, steel type Pokemon were my fucking kryptonite for the longest time. It's not like I didn't have the opportunity to get one, but trying to catch Shadow Pokemon can be a pain in the ass. Shadow Pokemon have access to this move called Shadow Rush. It's an attack that ignores all types, so it's good as a neutral attack, but every time it's used, it does a little damage to the Shadow Pokemon. I've lost like five attempts at catching a specific Shadow Pokemon because the piece of shit would use Shadow Rush while it was in critical health, and it ended up fainting as a result. Well, guess I'm not adding that one to my team, and I didn't feel like resetting my game to try again because I didn't want to reset my current progress. Sometimes you find Shadow Pokemon after an onslaught of like three to four trainers, so what, did you really want me to rush back to a save point after every individual trainer I came across in the off chance that I run into a shadow Pokemon, and even then a shadow Pokemon I might give a shit about? Nah, man, I gotta get a move on. But you go ahead and add a shadow Pokemon to your team, but since it's under the influence, it can't amount to much at first besides using Shadow Rush. There's also a chance that the poor thing can enter hyper mode, where it enters an emotional fever pitch. Their critical hit ratio goes up significantly, making Shadow Rush a pretty potent attack. But you can't use items on them for healing, there's a chance they won't listen to you at all because they're out of control. They may even attack your teammates. The very process of entering hyper mode eats up a whole turn itself too, which makes no sense to me. You can snap a shadow Pokemon out of hyper mode by using this call feature. You shout out their name and they calm down. But this can only be done in battle. If a shadow Pokemon finishes a battle in hyper mode, then you can't heal them in the overworld unless you use a specific item on them to get them out of it, which isn't always immediately available. Shadow Pokemon also don't gain experience, and this scared the shit out of me at first. I'm thinking, oh fuck, do I need to repeatedly catch Shadow Pokemon at higher levels just to remain current? God, that sounds obnoxious, but no, it's possible to remove the corruption from a Shadow Pokemon's heart. You can use a Time Flute in this shrine at the Relic Forest, and use the power of Celebi, the time-traveling Pokemon, to restore a Shadow Pokemon back to normal. There's only three of these in the whole game though, so for everyone else, you gotta do the more rigorous purification process. To purify a Shadow Pokemon, you need to drain this meter below their health, which you can eventually do by using the Shadow Pokemon in battle, walking with it, using special items, taking it to a daycare. As the meter drains, the Pokemon will slowly gain access to their previous moves. And when the meter drains completely, you can take the Shadow Pokemon to the Shrine in Relic Forest and complete the purification. They regain all the experience they missed while in their Shadow State, and could very possibly jump ahead a few levels because of that. It was enough to evolve my Flaffy into an Ampharos, and I breathed a sigh of relief, but then I also thought, oh shit. I gotta do that again for every Pokemon I wanna add it to my team. The very thought alone was exhausting, and that is how I can describe Colosseum. It is exhausting. In a game with little story, where all you do is head to the next area, fight the trainers in your way, fight those trainers again to purify your shadow Pokemon, and then repeat the whole process again later on, Colosseum got old quick, and by end game it reached a boiling point. Cypher admins were always several levels above my team, but the final battle is six fucking battles in a row with no breaks. 
four trainers, the head honcho of Cypher, and then the real head honcho of Cypher who shows up with no build up, it's pathetic. But the dickhead still uses Pokemon that are about 14 to 16 levels ahead of what you're using and the team is competent as fuck. A Caesar, a Salamence, a Slack King, just to name a few. This was one of the most obnoxious difficulty spikes I ever encountered in a Pokemon game. And what was originally a rather short game for RPG standards was now adding about three hours to the clock because of the amount of grinding I needed to do. In a game of nothing but double battles that are just as slow as stadium battles, all this just to stand a chance. I've already revisited these areas countless times just to purify my Pokemon and catch up on levels and now I gotta do it all again more rigorously because of the sheer level gap. At least you can jump straight into the final match should you lose, but the developers overdid this bit, given the limited resources. I didn't want to play the game anymore at this point, I was burnt out. But I stuck around and I managed to win eventually and the day was saved. And there's not much to the post game besides nabbing more shadow Pokemon for completionist's sake, though you do revisit the Snagum hideout that you blew up in the beginning and... Why wasn't Team Snagum a bigger part of this story? You blew up their base! There's a fight with the leader near the end of the game, but that's the only time he ever shows up. You'd think you'd be on your ass big time after blowing up his house. Well, all I can say is that I hope Gale of Darkness is a better time. Coliseum has plenty of good ideas and I admire how it requires you to take a slightly different approach to the standard Pokemon formula, but despite the attempt in changing the status quo, it doesn't do much to change the foundation to give it its own identity. If you're gonna remove core elements of a traditional Pokemon game but don't bother to fill the gaps you left behind, then you end up with something shallow. A bear as fuck story, nothing much to do but Pokemon battles, and there's still a need to grind your ass off to even finish the game. It is not broken, it is completely functional, but it is tiresome and one I'm glad I'm done with. You can skip this one, stick with the mainline games. So if you're heading to Momocon this Memorial Day weekend over in Atlanta, Georgia, I guess I'll see you there. It's Brain Scratch Com's 10th anniversary this year, and I, I still don't know what that means just yet. But when I get back home, I'll be taking a look at Coliseum's sequel, Gale of Darkness for the GameCube, and then, finally, we'll get to Pokemon Generation 4. I know I'm taking my time getting there, but I, I do want to cover a few bases here, so uh, just wait a little longer, then we'll get there together. Thank you all for watching. Have yourselves a fantastic night. Night, and take care. You cannot steal our Pokemon! Who will save the Pokemon? Gotta, gotta save them. them. Gotta, gotta save them. them all. You can save the Pokemon. Gotta, gotta save them. them. Gotta save them.